Upset Min David from Trivial Solutions I owe here. And today uh, we already spake about high level goals of infra, what uh, file system I prefer, ZFS. Uh, we already spake about operating systems I prefer. So today I'll talk about what do I do and what I want from provisioning. Provisioning is the process of when you configure your machines and you know hopefully you push to the git repository and machines catch the changes that they need and you don't need to ssh to every machine by hand and you know modify configurations by hand start stop containers by hand write system d units by hand I, ain't nobody got time for that right these days <laughs> so i will talk also first i talk what should we want in high level from our provisioning tools that we use and our processes that we do. So first thing, what I want to do with this layer, I don't want to fiddle with it a lot, ideally at all. What I want to do is get to the minimal state to run Docker containers in a scheduler like Nomad. Once I get there, I don't need to deal with this. It's like, you know, uh, a lot of companies just provision if if they need to run like a Java app like Kafka on a node then they provision that they install uh, Java version they defile the entire machine for Java then they install Kafka and all jars and that stuff we could completely avoid these this may be not a part of provisioning process we could get rid of it completely you know if you want to run Kafka if you get to the state where you can run Docker containers, how you can save a lot of time is, you know, just run Docker container of Kafka. It has Java, it has everything you need already in it. So I don't know why people would want to do that. You know, provision machines like it becomes part of their deployment process and they need to put a lot of stuff in the machine. And of course, such machines are fragile and then need to be reinstalled eventually once they, you know, get defiled enough if you would so we want instead of provisioning a lot of different stuff we may provision occasionally engine front end and whatnot that's fine but ideally just get minimal state where we can run docker containers that's it so it would be the simplest thing we can do right so another point is we should have our provisioning source version right do not do stuff by hand, do not SSH to machines by hand, right? We want to push changes to Git. In case things go wrong, we can revert to commit, we can run provisioning again, it works again, right? So we should have our provisioning sources version of how do we deal with the machines, right? And another point, uh, a lot of companies choose different way. They, you know, push to Git and machines automatically pull and uh, may or may not work. <laughs> Somebody might push commit late at night at the end of the day and alerting fires, you know. Uh, how do you fix that? Not good. So what I like to do, since re realistically, if we do so little with provisioning, the sources are small. We can view all the changes that we do this this is just the base of the system it should be small so if we do some changes to that then once we do some changes i prefer to run provision manually on every machine so that it would pull the latest source and apply the changes to the machine and then we see uh, i can test like you know Okay, first machine ran. Okay, it's good. Then we can try another machine once we get caught. Now, okay, changes are working. Then we can roll to all the machines, right? So I, I'm i very cautious with touching this layer because, you know, if we get something down, if, say, console config is bad, then your <laughs> DNS will stop working, right, with DNS mask. So I'm very cautious with this layers. I try to keep it very minimal, very simple, just just the base so that we can build on top of that and hopefully the up things in the system will keep working with good foundation so yeah run provision manually and again this like kind of adds to this point if you don't change anything 
then it is unlikely to stop working, right? So I have this small layer and if I don't perform any changes to it, like for a while, if I do it like rarely, I upgrade Linux kernel or something, I might upgrade Nomad console, right? If I do changes rarely, then I enjoy a lot of time where this layer just is static. It doesn't change at all. And if it doesn't change, usually it doesn't break. I, of course, there are exceptions to this rule. Uh, some scale might, you know, run out. Some component might receive a lot of requests, right? But generally, errors in production don't happen because of scale. They happen because someone did something. And if we don't do anything, it's unlikely that things will go wrong. Very simple. <laughs> yeah. So I don't like to change this layer, right? It should be base, static, and it should stay clean and serve us long life, right? So, and ideally secrets are in memory, right? So what I mean by that is, uh, you know, ideally we'd have, when we provision secrets, you know, there's this, uh, if we do Ansible, then there's this uh, key that unlocks the rest of the secrets. Well, it can be many keys, but I usually use one. And uh, with that master key that needs to decrypt the configs, and configs are in the source are encrypted, but they have to be there in the machine for a certain time if it pulls to get uh, to decrypt that state. So I like to keep that key in memory. And I like to keep other sensitive configs in memory because, you know, if if someone say like uh, <laughs> cut off cables and steals machine from there, this is hypothetical. In reality, this will probably never happen, but it's good to think about these things that, you know, you know, even if this disaster scenario happens where a hurricane like tears down the data center and some kid just, you know, walks around ruins of data center, finds a server, pulls out the hard drives, maybe tries to scan for some private keys or whatever. Even in this hypothetical scenario, you know, I know that if I keep secrets in memory protected so that only root can access it, if the server shuts down, all of that is lost. And then I need as an admin to reprovision it again. And when you run bare metals, you don't restart them often. They usually restart like uh, these new servers every, if you restart server, it takes like five minutes until they get up and running. You don't do that often. These machines just serve so that they, you know, keep on running and keep on running your different containers, right? So that's my logic here. I keep sensitive things in memory. And again, overkill, keep it static. I mentioned this already. If we keep it minimal changes, it will serve us a long time and we don't need to we don't need to do much really to keep the system just keeps on going right usually things don't change much then right so what do we want to provision this layer specifically we will be running docker containers so of course we want to provision docker if you're on debian of course you use the official docker repository not the default app get install docker uh, we provision console for service discovery and the nomad will be able to register secrets to console of course there's also console connect where if you want if i was running this in a bank like really you need to add very many layers of security for enterprise clients so with console connect every service even if it's inside of elan inside the data center you can uh, do TLS encryption inside. So even if some malicious actor gets access to the network, they can't sniff uh, your packets. Uh, they will see encrypted TLS traffic with console connect. You can do that with console. And for another secrets provisioning tool is Vault from HashiCorp and they will all work together, Docker, Vault and Nomad, right? And uh, Vault also, abides by this principle, it keeps secrets in memory. So if Vault instance is restarted, then what you do is you need to unseal every Vault instance, like with multiple Shamir keys. Well, it depends on the configuration, but you know, if you restart Vault instance, the secrets are gone. And another thing, provisioning Vault, uh, Vault 
it uses like locked memory but essentially what it's trying to do that its memory never gets swapped because its private keys would leak the disk and that's unsafe so what we do instead not to deal with this I disable swap on every single server today I don't think there's use for swap swap may have been useful like 20 years ago where you didn't have much memory and you wanted to run a lot application so they wouldn't stop wouldn't crash right but today using swap when you have like servers that that have like 128 gigs of ram or more 512 gigs of ram it it doesn't add any value at all right you could say oh well uh, then uh, if it runs out of memory that some applications wouldn't crash well Instead, what I do, because usually if applica if server runs out of memory, it's the nomad applications that are doing that. They will be rescheduled on that or other server. They will be fine anyway. But to detect those cases, I just monitor, did uh, out of memory kills happen on Linux machine? So that's how you deal with it. You just see alert, okay, this application is keeping killing. You need to do something then about it. Right? But other than that, disable swap, it has no value then you need to think what disk do i put it on i hope swap gets removed from operating systems in a decade you know i don't think it has any real use today right and of course we provision nomad our main beloved scheduler like i mentioned it works well with walls so when you write job declarations you don't you don't need to hard code secrets you just okay vault has the secret and you run jobs with tokens so then it becomes secure right so and it also interacts with console it, it will register your service like for prometheus so you don't need with prometheus tax so you don't need to do anything we'll talk about monitoring later but you know so all these things this is not random all these things are from HashiCorp, Console, Vault, Nomad, and they work great together, right? They're like match made in heaven. <laughs> and Kubernetes, as far as I'm concerned, it's way too complex. I think what happened with uh, Kubernetes and Nomad is that what happened with uh, like programming languages like C++ and Rust. So, you know, a lot of people were doing C++, you know, for games and everything, for web browsers. And Russ saw all the hindsights, all the pain points, what, what was wrong with C++, and then they developed Rust. So I imagine that is what happened with Nomad versus Kubernetes. As far as I'm concerned, Kubernetes is very complex YAML hell. And <laughs> I didn't have the greatest experiences with Kubernetes, so I'm quite biased towards Nomad. And it's very easy to provision. Like if you don't want any security, you want to just play around with Nomad, uh, without like generating TLS certificates, encryption keys, and anything, I got the uh, Nomad cluster on my hobby infrastructure running in, in a day. Like first time, you know, I didn't even try to practice anything. And of course, when project got serious, I added security and everything on top, right? But it's very easy to provision, single binary, right? You just and you register it to console so that it will find the uh, servers and clients and uh, yeah it's great product really recommend it okay so and another thing is of course zfs zfs as far as i'm concerned best file system made entire video about it nothing even comes close so we'll be using zfs and creating data sets and giving them uh, to nomad uh, containers so that you know if nomad container uses volume well, it doesn't know that it's ZFS underneath, but you bind the directory and it has the file system and you can then snapshot it, send it, do incremental backups, whatnot, great file system. So that's another what we want to provision. And uh, of course, I mentioned this, disable swap, right? So how to get these? Now we talked what to provision, what do we want out of provisioning? So what are our options? So I recommended a couple operating systems. One is Nix OS and uh, Plan B, you know, Debian, or it could be um, whatever. But uh, for both of these applies, well, for Nix OS, Nix things apply. So, for instance, I now use Colmena to provision uh, Nix OS machines. And Colmena works like a, 
it might not scale to thousands of machines because at this point it works like Ansible, uh, not Ansible pull, but Ansible where you need to SSH logically from your machine to all the machines and run updates, right? But you know, once you provision that, it's fine. You, you just can enjoy it and uh, it has support for secrets. It also abides the, by the principle, keep secrets in memory. If machine is restarted, secrets are gone, your possible secrets configs are gone, and then you need to reprovision again so that machine could, again, connect to your cluster with encryption keys and whatnot. So yeah, so I just use that. You run it once, you have it versioned, right? And Nixos provisioning is very simple. You don't deal with mutable state, it's just one thing, one OS is rebuilt, and you push the changes and you're done, right? So great option. And of course, uh, there are other uh, options like NixOps, the OG uh, NixOS provisioner. There is other like, I can't remember, but there are a few choices of it, but they're essentially the same to me because they do very similar thing. The bulk of the work happens in Nix package manager and NixOS that, you know, it would be essentially the same if you SSH in the machine and you added Nix configuration for that operating system and, you know, rebuild switch, you're done. So I use Colmena in this case if I provision Nix machines. You, there are like awesome Nix, you can check out our tools and system is expanding. I don't see big difference between them, they get the job done, so. And the plan B, like if you're running something like OG, like Debian or YAM, I just use Ansible. And uh, yeah, so when you provision Ansible, I can also give some tips that keep main secret file in memory that like unlocks other secrets. And I have this scheme for security that uh, secret, ans Ansible secret key is kept in memory, only accessible by the root and after half an hour, it is deleted. So, you know, configs are provisioned, but, and everything is running in memory, but if server is rebooted, then uh, config might need to be reinstated, right? And well, on some infra, I put a uh, secret, uh, like config is generated to disk. And I wouldn't do that today. I do it in memory. All the config in memory ideally, but I have some info that config is in disk. But, you know, ideally you keep things in memory. And uh, yeah, you version this. And uh, of course, Ansible, other people, there was the saying back in the day that, you know, Ansible today, uh, like Ansible is slow because you would SSH into every machine and then you need to have good connection. And if you have thousands of servers, well, then that's bad. And yeah, that those are valid points, but today you can just use Ansible pull so that Ansible becomes like chef uh, and that you just download the latest version from the Git, every single machine from Git repository just pulls and it runs configs locally. So it's super fast, can scale infinitely. So that's what I use. But anyway, there, I don't see much difference between something like Ansible and Chef, and I had experience, extensive experience with both. But like, you just, again, these should be, if you're using Chef or Ansible for this, this layer should be very simple because you do minimal things to keep things working. And, to provision containers. The main point is this. Once we get here, the provisioning tool doesn't really matter all that much, to be honest. And it, it, that layer just keeps static and things just keep on working. So I don't mess much. Once infra is up and running, you don't, de you don't need to do anything, really. Well, you need from time to time, you upgrade Linux kernel, you upgrade low net binaries, you upgrade console, right? You upgrade all you upgrade OpenZFS, right, from time to time. But, you know, usually you don't change it. It just static and it just keeps on working. So, yeah, so, you know, if you, you have some suggestions, you know, what you could also add it as an admin, you can keep that in a comment below. 
And this was David from Trivial Solutions.io. I'm signing out. Peace.